Good evening, everyone. I am Janet Gornick. I am Professor of Political Science and Sociology at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, and wearing my hat as the co-founder of this lecture series along with Tim Smeeting, who is somewhere. Right there, thank you. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you uh, this afternoon. Uh, Tim Smeeting and I co-founded this series in 2015. We were both connected to Lee through Lee's many years of work um, with the Luxembourg Income Study, which is now known as LIS, the Cross National Data Center in Luxembourg. I'm not going to say too much about the series because it's described in a program that's floating around here. But in short, the series aims to highlight research uh, within the many substantive areas that Lee where Lee really contributed, which includes, of course, research on poverty, inequality, urban culture, and social policy. When the series was founded, Lee's family and several friends and colleagues generously contributed, and we now have uh, funds in hand for about eight lectures. The venue alternates between Harvard and the City University of New York, my home. Um, and tonight's lecture is the third one and our second one here at Harvard. We are um, especially pleased to be back here uh, in Cambridge because one advantage is that it makes it easier for Lee's family to attend. And I'm just happy to say we're really immensely pleased to have Lee's family with us um, in the audience. Lee's wife, Carol Rainwater, is here. And, um, <laughs> and his daughter, Catherine Rainwater, and his son, John Rainwater, and daughter-in-law, Susan Stevenson. Uh, we also have several of the donors with us as well. Um, so let me go back in time very briefly. Don't want to touch this computer. Um, let me go back to 1983. Lee, collaborating with a group of social scientists from six countries, uh, dreamed up the idea of LIS, uh, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, LIS is a research center and a data archive. And the mission of LIS now, as it has been for all of cross-national microdata that can then be used by researchers around the world who are working on poverty, inequality, and uh, research on other types of socioeconomic uh, outcomes. So many people contributed to the founding of LIS, but by all accounts, Lee was the intellectual godfather um, of LIS. And I do want to say that some of those other contributors are here. Tim's meeting, as many of you was Lee's longtime partner and collaborator at LIS, and together they directed LIS for 23 years. Um, I'm happy to point out Sherry Minton, who is also here. Sherry was absolutely crucial in building LIS, which is as important as the, de the development of the data, so we're really happy to have her um, with us. I also want to mention that Irv Garfinkel is here, and Irv was a very early user of the data and has also been a longtime supporter and part of the LIST um, community. So as for myself, if I can indulge that in a moment, for a moment, I certainly can't overstate Lee's impact. In 1989, I was a PhD student um, at Harvard, and I was working as Lee's teaching assistant for a class on comparative social policy at the Kennedy School. Um, and two weeks into the term, Lee pulled me aside and asked if I wanted to join the LIST staff in Luxembourg to design and build a social policy database. So my immediate concern, uh, as was Tim's, I know, six years earlier when Lee brought him in, uh, my main concern was I had absolutely no idea where Luxembourg was. So um, I had an atlas, as we had in those days, and I ran home and looked in the atlas, and that settled the mystery. So um, I said, OK, that looks interesting. And I got on a plane and moved to Luxembourg, where Tim and Lee retrieved me from the tiny airport. Um, and I immediately found the cross-national work to be electrifying. And I was hooked. What was supposed to be a one-year stint turned into 32 years. Um, for the first 15 of those years, I had a front row seat watching Lee and Tim build this remarkable data infrastructure and at the same time create an immense body of influential cross-national research on poverty and inequality. It was, of course, an invaluable learning opportunity, and I will always be grateful for that. Um, I also had the privilege of being Lee's final dissertation advisee, um, and that said, when he retired, uh, due to some rule that I never really understood. Harvard bounced him from being my chair, and he became uh, a reader. So Chris Winship, who's also here, stepped in as chair, and he pushed me pretty much literally across the finish line. Um, I went on later to succeed Tim as the director of LIST, and I served in that role for 10 years, and there was certainly not a day 
uh, went by that I didn't hear Lee's voice uh, in my head. Um, so on that note, it's really an honor and a pleasure to welcome all of you this evening. I know that Lee would be absolutely thrilled that Orlando is the honored speaker. I know that Carol is and the rest of the family as well. Um, so now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Frank Dabin, who you all know, chair of the Harvard Sociology uh, Department. So Frank, please. Uh, thank you so much, Janet, and um, thank you for coming up today and for organizing this terrific event. Um, this is the third time we tried to organize this event, so thanks to everybody who's played a role, and thank you for sticking with it. Uh, it to me, it's just phenomenal that we're actually here doing this. I could not have believed this even a few months ago. Um, I want to especially thank Odette Binder, who... Uh, is on our staff and played a big role in organizing it, um, as did uh, Jess Viador and Michael Van Unen. Um, so it's really an honor to, to introduce Orlando Patterson, the John Cowles Professor of Sociology. Often the task of introducing someone in a context like this is one of embellishing a, an intellectual record. In this case, the job is really one of disembellishing an intellectual record, because if I began to uh, expound on Orlando's full contributions to the field, he would have no time to speak. Um, Orlando is really a rare bird in sociology. He's a true public intellectual having published often in the New York Times, the New Republic, the Washington Post. He's also been very influential in policy circles, not least um, by being a frequent and important advisor to Jamaican governments since the early 1970s. But he is also the ultimate scholar. In the academic world, Orlando has more than anyone shaped our thinking about slavery and freedom and about the legacy of slavery and its consequences for social inclusion and post-colonial societies. In academia, he also continues to make an impassioned call for the importance of historical and comparative work, um, which the comparative element certainly um, exemplifies Lee's commitment to comparative studies of inequality and social policy. Um, he argues that we cannot possibly understand our own time and place without contrasting it to other times and places. I thought of how to summarize his works in the field of slavery and freedom, uh, post-colonialism and inequality, and I came up with nothing better than my favorite books of Orlando Patterson, and there are many. Um, the Sociology of Slavery in 1967, An Analysis of the Origins, Development, and Structure of ne Negro Slave Society in Jamaica, 1968. Ethnic Chauvinism, The Reactionary Impulse, 1977. Slavery and Social Death, 1982. Freedom in the Making of Western Culture, 1991, which won the National Book Award. If I listed all the rest of the awards, we'd also have no time for Orlando's speech. The Ordeal of Integration, 1997, Rituals of Blood, Consequences of Slavery in Two American Cities, 1998. The Cultural Matrix, Understanding Black Youth, 2015. Some of my own former students have mentioned that my productivity has appeared to slow down over time. So I want to add the last two. The Confounding Island, Jamaica and the Postcolonial Predicament, 2019 and The Sociology of Slavery, Black Society in Jamaica, 1655 to 1838, which was published this year. Orlando has also penned three novels, and he is a rock star in the classroom, being the teacher of our two largest classes, responsible for approximately half of all of our undergraduate enrollments. Today's talk is titled... Slavery and Genocide, Jamaica, the U.S. South, and the Demography of Evil, 1650 to 1830. Please join me in welcoming the inimitable, the unstoppable, Orlando Patterson.
Okay, thanks, Frank, for that very generous introduction. And it's a real pleasure, finally, being able to do this. Um, I don't think I've ever had this experience where a talk was um, postponed uh, three times, and over the course of which I changed the topic <laughs> because I'd become very much involved with the subject which I thought um, might be of more interest, at least um, to me. Um, uh, I, part of my problem when I'm asked to give talks is that I hate repeating myself and I hate talking on subjects I've worked on a long time. And I, I, I usually prefer at least to be involved uh, to present something I'm more currently involved with. And uh, in a way, um, this talk brings together something I've been involved with all my life, but uh, a topic, um, genocide, which I've become increasingly involved um, with. Uh, Lee was uh, actually among the first colleagues I met um, when I came up here to Harvard in 1970. Uh, he had arrived just the year before in 1969. And so in a way we we're both sort of newcomers. Um, I strongly, I immediately took a liking to him, as so many people do. His combination of a sort of friendly, unassuming manner with a very sharp, incisive mind it takes you by surprise because this very assuming person, you, um, you don't expect these nuggets to um, um, come from. Um, he had uh, published in 1970, the year I came here, um, is one of his great works. And I use that adjective um, deliberately. Behind Ghetto Wall. As you can see from all the, <laughs> this is a much read um, work um, and a much beloved work. It just came out this, the same year. I came here and the year after he had arrived. Uh, the study of um, low income pop black population in one of the worst, possibly the worst federal slum ever developed, um, Purit um, Ego, which after less than a couple of decades, was literally blown up um, by the federal government because it was such a nightmare. Um, the, um, it, the, that work is, in my view, easily um, one of the best works ever published on the life and life strategies uh, of um, the um, poorest of the poor in our country. It's, um, it is, however, sadly, um, one of the great neglected masterpieces in sociology. Now, you've heard about his quantitative work, um, it, uh, but I must inform you that he was one of the best urban ethnographers. And the, those case studies in this book, um, one of which, by the way, is the Patterson family. <laughs> I remember opening the work and see, I just, I'm amused by, is simply one of the best in interpret analytic uh, uh, interpretations of field data um, I've, I've, I've ever read. And it's, it's a neglected classic. And those of you, I'd like to make a pitch here. Um, if you haven't read that work, um, I, I certainly I would urge you to. Um, the, um, it's, it's a classic waiting to be rediscovered in much the same way that um, Du Bois classic work, Black Reconstruction, had to wait a very long time to be rediscovered um, by sociologists. Hopefully it won't take as long. It took 80 years for sociologists to finally saying, oh my goodness, we have a great work here. Uh, and I uh, started reading it again. Um, the, um, I just found um, uh, his analysis, especially of what he calls you know, the expressive style in black life to be just um, a marvelous, um, uh, uh, insightful um, um, uh, uh, account of, um, 
of the ways in which people deal with absolute poverty. Um, I also discovered uh, not long after we met that me actually liked dancing, which you never have thought. And uh, I myself had just arrived and still had my Caribbean cultural sort of mode with me and actually made, <laughs> um, in my early parties here, I would um, turn on the music as we do in Jamaica. And um, I'll never forget the look on David Riesman's face when I <laughs> turned up my volume at the party, my very first party on Fernal Street. But uh, um, the um, Lee and Carl liked dancing. And I recall we started a little tradition. We had some dance. Lee and Carl um, started sort of um, uh, inviting folks to dance at their parties. Do you remember, Carl? Those are wonderful. Until, until the, the chill of New England culture finally reasserted itself. And, and we, we, we all went back to our old cocktail parties. In, uh, in, but I remember those days very well. Very, very well. Um, okay. So it, it's a real honor to, to be able to do this. Uh, I want to emphasize it because, especially since Lee moved, uh, and it was a sad day for me when he left. We shared the same research office here for many, many years. Uh, when Lee moved to Luxembourg, he also moved from sociology uh, into income um, studies, uh, away from the kind of sociology which I did then and still do. Um, so today what I'd... Um, like to do is um, um, look at the two subjects which I've become very involved with, one of which I've been involved with all my life, uh, slavery and, um, and, and genocide. Um, the, um, the, these are subjects which have separate research traditions, but um, I've been pleasantly surprised to find that um, uh, uh, genocide scholars have increasingly become interested in the issue of slavery and the extent to which it, uh, how it relates to, um, uh, uh, to their subject. Now, um, scholars of slavery have, from time to time, um, uh, raised the issue of the extent to which slavery was a kind of genocide. And, uh, but have never really fully pursued it. And um, uh, I decided to, um, to, 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 to do so, partly because um, uh, over recent years, people would come to me and say, uh, do you know that the folks in genocide studies have been using your stuff, especially slavery and social death? And I said, no. And so I went, I got curious and was indeed very pleasantly surprised to see the extent to which slavery and social death had in fact become a very um, you know, uh, used text in, um, in genocide studies. So I said, I better get involved with this. I mean, you know, um, and um, indeed um, I did. And I want to talk about um, what I've discovered um, and um, where I'm at in, um, in trying to bring together these two um, disciplines and thinking about them. Um, the, um, and I, I want to look at US and Jamaican slavery, the two slaveries that I've um, spent a lot of time studying, and um, how the issue of genocide uh, plays out in, um, in them. Um, I want to, if I have the time, then um, raise the question of the intergenerational consequences, the legacy of slavery. And the very curious fact uh, that my discipline seems to have a bizarre aversion to the study of slavery and its consequences. 
try to figure that one out. And um, I'll say something about that, um, especially in light of the fact that almost all the other social sciences have become engaged with the subject of slavery, including especially economics, but also political science, and, uh, and even um, psychology. And, um, uh, and yet, oddly, the discipline which is most engage with the problem of inequality, slavery, poverty, seems to have a strange allergy um, or reluctance to be, get engaged in this subject. And it, it's, um, uh, uh, it, it, it puzzles me and it troubles me a lot. Um, so I'm gonna, if I have the time, um, briefly um, mention to you or bring you up to date with all the exciting work that's being done in other disciplines on the legacy of slavery. Disciplines you wouldn't have uh, thought I would be interested. So, as I said, there's growing interest in both the connection between slavery and, uh, and, and, and genocide. Um, um, there's, of course, been a, an academic resurgence of uh, interest in slavery. Um, uh, partly coming out of this university, um, the work on uh, slave studies, of course, is, is a rich tradition of this for a long time, but it's been sort of very much in uh, among historians and a, a few um, uh, people in other social sciences. But the subject has um, um, begun to intrigue people outside of strictly academic um, um, areas. And, um, uh, especially um, uh, after the um, great success of um, the work by Sven Beckert and a whole insurgent group of um, uh, new historians who have made a very bold claim that slavery was not just this um, sad, tragic thing that happened um, in the past and separate from um, uh, the great um, tradition of American um, history, but as an integral part of, um, of American um, history and an integral part of this is the growth of capitalism. Again, it should surprise many people, although we've known it for a long time. Um, and um, uh, and um, the, uh, that interest is sort of um, uh, grew, especially after the New York Times um, and picked it up and sort of created this um, um, 1619 project, which itself has generated a great deal of controversy. But uh, slavery is um, in the air. But, and it's also um, um, become, uh, as I said, extended beyond um, um, purely academic interests with the um, growing uh, awareness on the part of the leaders of our great institutions of learning um, uh, that actually we had some uncomfortable connections with slavery. Um, uh, and um, this delightful book, sort of Ebony and Ivy, sort of documents that. Um, this is a quote here. Uh, Harvard became the first in a long line of North American schools to target wealthy planters as a source of enrollment and income. Uh, the American college was an extension of merchant wealth, and a wealthy merchant was almost certainly engaged in slave trade and commerce, especially in the late um, 17th century when Harvard was founded. Um, that, so, as you know, at our university, there's a, 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 a slavery group which was set up by um, uh, our president. And uh, after his report, which created a lot of um, excitement, uh, over $100 million was very generously provided by the president to sort of promote um, slavery, interest in slavery beyond just academic um, interest. Well, that, of course, has been the same in Brown, in our law school, and so on. So um, that, that sort of, so push slavery out of the purely academic sort of domain in which it existed. Um, the same is true of Holocaust um, studies. 
Uh, and the relative newness of it is, 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 is important to emphasize. I remember when I, in, in my British days, when I started and taught in England in the 60s, um, uh, I was always surprised of how little discussion there was on the Holocaust, um, certainly in, in Britain, but also in Europe generally. Um, it wasn't until uh, the 70s, really, um, some 30 years after um, the horrors, um, that the um, uh, real interest, um, um, academic and otherwise, began um, to, to, to develop. And, um, and it took, again, some time after that for the broader culture to become engaged with um, the subject. I mean, uh, important developments such as the Holocaust Memorial Museum um, was, was one um, uh, important um, development. Um, and um, the um, task force such as the US Genocide Prevention Task Force. Uh, similarly, uh, and somewhat later, again, I, I was for a long time very surprised at um, how um, uh, the level of awareness and concern and involvement with slavery in this society, given that for most of its history, it was a slave society. This is really puzzling. To me, and um, I didn't understand, I partly understand why um, Euro American, white Americans were not involved, but I was also curious as to why African Americans had not made more of an effort to, um, to, to, to make slavery and its, its, its the extraordinary role it played uh, in this society uh, a part of the national consciousness. Uh, as I said, that's happily um, began to change, but in just uh, recently, uh, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, it's a great institution, it's only a few years old, um, and um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, again, it's only a few years old, but it's there. So these two great tragedies, these two great horrors of the modern world, finally sort of um, escapes purely academic um, interest. And um, I guess um, it was inevitable that we begin to think about how the two are connected, although they're still relatively, uh, I'm still surprised how recently that is. So um, let me begin by very summarizing very briefly what slavery is all about. Because uh, slavery is one of those things which people talk about but really don't know what in depth or are not interested in getting to um, uh, understand what it is. Uh, I think spent my whole life sort of trying to figure it out. Um, uh, I can sort of, I thought I'd very briefly sort of um, summarize what I've um, found. So, um, among all slaveries, um, I've defined it as a form of social death, by which I mean, um, in the simplest terms, it's a relation of domination, of total domination, one person by another, which is very unusual in human history. Usually in all societies, from hunter-gatherer right through to the most advanced, there are usually protections, there are usually constraints on um, one person's capacity to um, completely control another person, whether it's kinship constraints or whether it's constraints by, um, uh, you know, friends or um, uh, protectors and so on. The total domination uh, involving, in almost all cases, the right of life and death. Now, a lot of countries have laws um, about um, not killing a slave, but the laws are usually so circumscribed that it, they're never applied. This is true of the United States. Um, you could kill a slave with impunity in the United States if you're a white. Um, and um, the concept which 
as most attracted attention in my definition of um, what it is, is natal alienation. I have to emphasize this because it's, it's what sort of traveled, um, especially to the field of um, genocide studies. Um, what I found was that um, a quintessential element of slavery was that the slave did not belong. Uh, the slave was the ultimate outsider, but more than that, the slave was sort of deracinated, he had been captured from another society, but not reinserted and not made a member of the other society. The slave is essentially someone who does not belong to society because they belong to a person. And one can't overemphasize what that means. Um, having no rights of birth, we're all born with rights of uh, natal rights, if you like, and, but we all belong to some kind of commu um, community. Now, I'm not saying, and it's, it's very easy to misunderstand this, that slaves didn't have relationships and so on. That's not the point. Of course they did. Uh, I'm saying that those who control the society, those who define the society, its laws and so on, those who define what's legitimate, who's a legitimate member, define the slave as not belong, as an out, ultimate outsider, totally natally alienated, alienated from uh, um, rights of birth meant alienation from one's past, uh, alienation from uh, what one may call a sort of community of memory, which you can, you know, which you're an active part, and which you places you not only physically in a place but in time, um, and it's a condition of absolute degradation. Slave has no honor. Um, no, uh, and, and um, is a degraded person. Um, now, that idea of slavery I developed in contrast with the more legalistic view, it's a sociological um, um, view of slavery, if you like, or a social historical one. But you know, um, what are the implications of this? And this is important because, especially if we're going to uh, pay attention to what the legacies of slavery are. And, um, you know, I found um, a work by Susan Fisk, the social psychologist, uh, to be very valuable in this. Um, I came across it when I was doing the, um, the preface to the second edition of Slavery and Social Death. Uh, and um, um, I've always wondered, um, you know, uh, is there some attempt to define what is quintessentially human? What makes you human? And surprisingly, it's hard to find that. You know, psychologists are working on so little, 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 little problems and so on, defining a particular you know, issue and so on. But the big question, the big question, what it is that constitutes your humanness? I was just quite absolutely delighted when uh, I found such a work. Um, and Susan um, Fisk at Princeton's. Um, work and my God, it was um, you know it 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 was perfect in the sense that the five fundamental features of what constitutes being human are exactly the five fundamental things which are denied the slave. This is just extraordinary. So. Number one, and she sees it as the fundamental one, uh, belonging. All human beings, everywhere. So they need to belong, a sense of belonging to a group, to a place, or what have you. And um, this, this underlies all the others. We, as humans, we need to belong and have some sense that we belong. Um, the need to make sense of our environment, to be able to make sense of it. It's his, um, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's important, if you think about it, um, that in one way or the other, you have to uh, be able to um, understand your world and to say, well, you know, this is, um, it, this is so obvious that, you know, it's hard to, um, to, 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 to grasp it until you realize that it, uh, for many, it doesn't exist. Um, that 
the world doesn't make sense um, if you um, get up each morning and um, you have no decision about what you do. You are told what to do. That it bears no relationship to any things that satisfies your um, self as a person or your children or your parents and so on. Um, it's the world is, you, you cannot make sense of such a world. Um, that um, third, that you have some control uh, over outcomes in your life. Again, this is the thing that this slave does not have. No control whatever over outcomes in your life. Again, think about your own existence, getting up each morning, and the extent to which, you know, you're a feeling of having some control, some control. Even children feel that way. And of course, we teach our children to um, develop such a sense of control. The need to view yourself as worthy or improvable or feel good about yourself. Again, how can you uh, feel good about yourself when you can be whipped at any time, when you can be stripped naked, when even as a grown mother can be sort of beaten in front of her children, or a father, uh, or a grandfather, and, sort of, and this sort of um, sense of um, worthlessness becomes an integral part of that condition. And then one which is very important, extremely important, the need to trust others, to view the world as a place that facilitates group life, attachment, independence, and love. That's, that's also absolute trust. Trust is absolutely fundamental. Now, Fundamental human motives, as Fisk calling, are assaulted in slavery. Um, okay, genocide. What is that all about? The word was invented, was first um, you know, um, used by uh, Raphael Lemkin in um, 1944. And um, as a result of partly building on his of activism around the subject. Um, the, um, um, to um, uh, United Nations in 1948 um, had uh, 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 ratified um, a statement uh, on it and defined it in um, in more legal terms. So genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a nation, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A killing members of the group, B causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. That's one is important, by the way. Um, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, it's been ratified by 149 states. The United States took its time on this, by the way. Uh, and, um, and, but more importantly, uh, even among, for those um, who have not ratified it, uh, it's now recognized as part of general customary international law by the International Court of Justice. And several people have been trying on this. Now, almost every clause has been contested by academics and others who, in, in a very lively so, um, uh, genocide studies group. Uh, for one, there's a problem of intent. To what extent is intent necessary in committing ma uh, mass um, killings? Um, uh, uh, and it's, um, there's a big controversy started around, for example, Sartre, who, um, who in a work on, an early work on um, genocide, um, claims that the American bombing in um, Vietnam, killings, uh, was not just war crimes, 
which does not count as genocide, by the way, but genocide. And um, in defending America, the issue of intent came up. That, and the idea is that central to the notion of genocide, it's argued, is the um, intention deliberately to kill, to destroy a particular group of people. And that was not the intention of the United States in the bombing. I mean, so mass killings are not um, by itself. You know, the, 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 the mass killings in the trenches of uh, World War I do not constitute um, genocide. And the bombings in Vietnam um, do not constitute genocide. Um, that's, um, uh, so there's a long debate about that. And the debate still continues as to um, the, the, the degree to which you have to intend and target a particular group and want to kill them because they are of a particular group, other than just killing them. Mass killings are all over the place. Uh, genocide emerges with that, that you've targeted a particular group. Um, there's also controversy about political um, groups, um, that it excluded political groups and um, the killing of groups. And a lot of people are very unhappy with that. Uh, there's the Stalin, Stalin brutal treatment of the peasants, which millions died. Is that genocide? Well, he didn't intend to kill them, but it ended up that way. Um, the preventing of birth is an important one, and I'm using that one uh, in my own uh, definition of, as you'll see, uh, Jim, what happened in Jamaica as um, a form of genocide. Preventing birth on a mass scale, especially, well, it doesn't have to be a mass scale, but preventing of birth, uh, of preventing people from reproducing as they are, would constitute an element of genocide. And then the question, how many, the body counts? How many you got to kill for it to become genocide? Uh, you know, I mean, is it has got to be mass killings? Uh, or can the killing of um, uh, just a few people, uh, but nonetheless be this right, you kill them because of whom they are, um, um, uh, could constitute um, genocide? Uh, I'm of the view that it does. Um, the, and finally, there is a question of cultural genocide or ethnocide, which is a lot of um, people who work in gen uh, genocide studies are very preoccupied with that question, the destruction of a people's culture. And I want to come to one of my favorite philosophers in this, uh, <laughs> and the person who basically got me into it, because <laughs> someone said, you got to read this this philosopher, because she's using slavery and social death as a central part of her argument. And um, in this very uh, the widely cited work, Claudia Card is a philosopher at Wisconsin and a feminist, uh, a feminist philosopher. Social death, she argues, is central to the evil of genocide, whether the genocide is homicidal or primarily cultural. And, um, and it distinguishes genocide from other mass murder. That's a heavy load to place on this concept, I thought. My goodness. Um, loss of social vitality is loss of identity and thereby of meaning for one's existence. Seeing social death at the center of genocide takes our focus off body counts and loss of individual talents, directing us instead to mourn Losses of relationships that create community and give meaning to the development of talents. Uh, the idea of natal alienation is central here. And quite a few people have picked, picked this up. Some people have contested it and so on. It's a <laughs> remarkable, very sort of um, uh, uh, brilliant uh, from the debate uh, around this claim. So um, she claims that centering social death uh, accommodates the position which said is controversial that genocidal acts are not always are necessarily homicidal. Um, so the, the forcible sterilization of women, which had meant that more than 60,000 women were forcibly or sterilized in the US in the 20th century. The forcible separation of children from their group 
uh, for re-education and assimilation. It's been in the news recently. The Pope recently took the extreme position of apologizing to the Native American population of Canada because of just this. And in a way, it's almost implicit that it was a kind of genocide, what was done, the forcible removal of Native American children at, with, who were targeted because they were of their culture and targeted in the sense that you wanted to strip them, strip them of their culture in order to re-educate them in another culture. That, that all amounted to um, a kind of genocide. And um, the reinforces sort of Claudia Carr's point. Uh, many physically brutal acts, on the other hand, are not necessarily genocidal. War crimes, as I mentioned, and um, all cri other crimes against humanity, done independent of victims' social connections. Um, and that rape, torture, starvation, and non-ethnic political groups, all of these are open to contention. I mentioned here, in the case of America, the killing of 20 children at Sandy Hook, Connecticut, with Dylan Roof's killing of nine black worshipers in Clarkston, South, South Carolina. Um, the latter constitutes uh, clearly a genocidal act. The former, brutal as it is, and if one isn't undermining his horror, um, uh, does not. This is being killed by the spirit. So someone is saying well, the kids are not being targeted because they of their ethnic group and so on. But um, so you begin to see how this can get rather complicated. These are just some examples. I, I was quite surprised. I so explored the amount of um, sterilization being done in America, especially and uh, the disproportionate number of it against um, 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 black women. And um, here it was, you know, um, a pamphlet extolling the benefits. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's genocide. It's just be felt syphilis study. So I would call this, one to speak of genocidal acts, uh, because as I said, as, uh, it, um, the body counts, the idea that it has been mass killings uh, is, is, is no longer held to this. So my own take on this, this sort of, um, uh, is, um, you know, while, I find Carl's position very attractive, and not just because she used my work as central. Um, but um, I, I couldn't sort of, had to sort of back away a little bit. Um, um, the idea that physical death is central is very entrenched. And uh, can one live with just the idea that sort of cultural death, ethnocide, constitutes genocide. Um, I, I'm still having um, some problems sort of coming fully to terms with that idea. I think, I think the body counts are important. <laughs> I think the physical part, but as I said, um, uh, even while intellectually understanding what Carter's getting at, I, I'm still kind of reluctant to get away from the idea that some physical killing uh, <laughs> has got to be there to make it um, for. I prefer then the distinction between genocide and ethnocide. Um, all genocide includes some form of ethnocide. So there I agree with Card, right? That, that's the distinction then between um, masculine crimes of war and so on and genocide. Um, uh, but not all ethnocide entails death, okay? Um, some extreme forms of ethnocide do amount to genocide. Uh, again, so I'm, I'm obviously sort of, you know, on, on the border here, and the Native American children forced into alien assimilation. I mean, I, I can't help feeling that there is, in my gut, that this is almost, almost sort of genocidal. Uh, it's a people being stripped of their culture. Um, and um, so obviously I'm wavering. Um, some extreme forms of ethnocide do amount to genocide. Then, that genocide inclu includes, and here I'm fully on the side of um, card, and in fact use it in the research I'm going to show you in a minute. <laughs> that genocide includes force prevention of reproduction because that's physical. That's physical. Okay, 
That's, that, that becomes physical again. That's carnal. Preventing a people to reproduce themselves, you know, is, is well, the equivalent of equiv killing them. You prevent them from being born, from, from expanding. So I'm, 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 I'm on card side on that one, that it, it, it does genocide in both sense of the term, both ethnic, ethnocide, and so on, right? Um, and in form the forced sterilization, infanticide. And there's this interesting phenomenon which I teach on um, a lot um, it, 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 in my trafficking course, gendercide. Some of you may not have heard of genocide, but the targeted killing of females. Our males, at this point, sort of, of a particular gender or, or a third gender, but it's usually female. Now, it's an estimated, and this may come as a shock to you, but there are 143 million missing women in the world today, according to the United Nations of 2020. Um, and um, that is to say, the targeted killing of women. Most of that comes from the targeted abort aborting of female fetuses, but also infanticide after they're born. Um, and 143 million is a conservative figure. Um, the term gendercide is coined to describe, I think it's a form of, it's a form of um, uh, genocide, wouldn't you say? I mean, we can talk about that. But um, it, it's a shocking figure, most people are shocked there. It was first brought, given sort of respectable academic attention by none other than Amartya Sen, who was the first to raise it. But, but the thing is, you can quantify it by, because of the simple fact that uh, we know the exact proportion of male and females who are born. And if you see the ratio start getting up to 130 men to 100 women, you know something is wrong. And you can sort of really calculate it on that basis. And on the basis of quite, quite conservative count, calculations, uh, 143 million women are missing in the world. Uh, that's kind of genocide. It also includes dangerous medical experiments, such as the famous syphilis experiments in America. Um, and um, the, uh, oh, another important point, it does not have to include all members of the group, okay? Hitler did not kill all the Jews. The fact that there are Jews who um, survived doesn't in any way lessen the fact that six million were killed. That's an important point to bear in mind. Um, see, and finally, uh, and for me, an important one, gendercide uh, can be protect, protracted, extended over a long period of time. Okay? Um, now, there have been a lot of works recently um, uh, on... Um, here in genocide and slavery. I, I, I'm pleasantly surprised by the, the literature on this. Um, the, um, the, the work of um, uh, the um, CAT, uh, was that BU, was sort of on the, the, the homicide um, department there, uh, homicide studies there at BU has done a fascinating work that came out recently, the Holocaust and New World Slavery. Um, work has been done, and one of the classic works on the Jews in Germany, um, Between Dignity and Despair, um, by Marion um, Kaplan, uh, incidentally used um, slavery and social death in an interesting way, arguing that the period between the 30s and 1940 was, she describes, a period of social death for the Jews in Germany, but that genocide, in a sense, begins with the death camps in 1940. She used, made extensive use of um, slavery and social death in that work. Um, the um, uh, fascinating work of philosophy just came out recently, Vessels of Evil, which looks at American slavery on the Holocaust. Now, uh, there's also uh, the very popular and controversial work of Goldhagen with Hitler's willing executioners who also use slavery and social death. And essentially what it all boils down to is that the fundamental difference between slavery, especially the new world slavery, and, um, 
and genocide or the Holocaust in the comparison is that the Germans, um, the, well, sorry, the, the, the slaveholder wants to maintain the life of the slave, to reproduce the slave, because they want to use their bodies so they're not into killing them. It's against their interest to kill them. Uh, that the whole point of the Holocaust is, in fact, the targeted killing, the destruction of the Jews. They all, in a sense, come down on this central point, although um, Thomas, in his Vessels of Evil, emphasizes natal alienation as a critical factor in his distinction between the Holocaust and slave. Um, I, uh, 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 but the idea of death then, of whether you want to kill, destroy the person just because of who, who they are, as opposed to needing them even though you despise them, is critical. Um, there is a too monolithic view of New World slavery, especially in the work of Katz, which is a very fine study, by the way. It just came out a, a couple of years ago. Um, there's significant variation among um, New World slavery, which complicates the story of comparing slavery and um, genocide. Um, with, with genocide. Um, differences in the patterns of residence among um, slaveholders uh, as to whether, in fact, they're living in their own society and are building a new Jerusalem, as the South thought it did, or a new kind of um, uh, medieval type situation, or, um, or whether they're absentee and um, spending their wealth in the mother country. There are very important demographic differences between the slave systems of the New World, um, whether the slaves are in the majority or not. Again, the US is very different from other countries in manumission rates, in opportunities for revolt, and in the degree to which African cultures can survive. Um, so um, it complicates the story. So Katz's attempt, and it's a fine study, it just comes down on the fact that no, the, um, uh, the New World State societies were not genocide um, uh, on, on this fundamental issue that in all cases, the owners wanted to preserve the bodies of their slaves and to reproduce them, as opposed to what went on in Germany and what went on with the Armenians and so on. Um, I, I think the, it falls apart. I think it's true of some cases, as I see, but not in others. And this is where I come to um, the two paradigmatic slave systems, which illustrates point very well, because um, the US and Jamaica, um, they were two, two paradigms. Uh, they're both plantation systems, but um, very different. Um, the scale of ownership, the average ownership is only about 10 slaves in the US South, surprisingly, and the uh, majority of whites did not own slaves. Um, the, um, uh, in, in Jamaica, the average ownership was over 100 slaves in a large plantation. Um, majority of the free in the South, um, were, majority of people were free and white. Um, sort of um, the great majority of the population in Jamaica from the early 18th century, early 18th century, were blacks and slaves. This is a slave society. So it's important to bear in mind that um, in only three states for a short period, Georgia and the Carolinas, um, were blacks ever the majority, even in the South. Whereas from the early 1700s, blacks are outnumbering um, whites 10 to 1 in Jamaica. The vast wealth of the Jamaicans, now it's hard to imagine today, but you know, a sugar plantation was like a, an oil field today. Um, and um, the, the wealth generated in Jamaica is almost incomprehensible today. I mean, it's been estimated um, that um, the per capita income of the average Jamaican white was 35 times that of the average North American white at that time. 
um, the, um, they were enormously wealthy. And they went back to Britain and, of course, translated their wealth into, um, you know, um, baronetcies and so on. The U.S. was a stable system, relatively through, through stable world. Jamaican was a Hobbesian nightmare, uh, as I've called it. So for slaves then, what you had then were two systems here. Um, and um, uh, in both, social death was, of course, the defining factor in both. But there, the distinction, um, uh, the, 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 the fun fundamental difference emerged. And I see, in a nutshell, the U.S. as a classic example of ethnocide. There's no doubt about that. The dominant culture was sort of really did um, they destroy this is the deracination of the African culture so they and offered very little opportunity to sort of um, you know re, re being reinserted in the society in which they found themselves. Which, let me add, I can't add it enough because people say, hey, what about the slave community which Lassen gave you all about? Of course, I mean, yeah, they all so interact with each other, they have sex, they want to do their thing, they want to have children. That's not the point. The point is they did not belong to America and had no place in this society by those who are powerful. And I remember to him, and that became an integral part of the culture. And that's why, in many ways, I insist on calling the Jim Crow South a neo slavery society, because the culture of slavery in which the notion of natal relation, which blacks have no place in this society, no legitimate, no belonging in this, persisted. If anything, grew worse, the more intense afterwards. So you can lynch them, and lynching was sim sim as a, a symbolic act. Powerful and cultural acts, and which often were presided over by priests, by people who were um, ordained ministers. And it was a powerful way of saying you did not belong. Okay, I mean, so that, um, that's not side, was the condition of black people during slavery. And I think it persisted some, to a significant degree afterwards. It's Jamaican slaves, I'm saying, were one of those cases of genuine gen genocide. Genocide, which, as I'll point out in a few minutes, almost approached six million. Okay? And the reason for that is, and I see my time is running out, <laughs> um, the Jamaican planters mercilessly pursued a demographic strategy which was very different from the US. What was that strategy? OK, the US, the slave population reproduced itself. By the 1730s, the black population in America was not only self-reproduced, and the great majority were born locally. And fewer and fewer Africans were needed. By the middle of the 1700s, there was no more need for um, In fact, you know, the US southern planters urged the abolition of the slave trade. They didn't need it. Uh, it's a totally different strategy pursued by the Jamaicans. The Jamaicans took the position, reproduction is a waste of time and a waste of money. Number one, you lose the woman's labor uh, while she's pregnant. Uh, number two, you have to feed the kid afterwards, so you lose her labor after that. She may die and so on. As for the kids, who are these little, I mean, piccaninnies? I mean, they're taking up all your property, your, your, your time, breathing them, and with a high rate of reproduction, a high rate of death, but infant mortality with disease, and so you're likely to lose them. So their calculation is reproduction is just a waste of money. It's important. It was a deliberate, deliberate decision. And they could make that decision because you could always buy a young slave, youth, preferably male, as long as there's a slave trade. So their calculation, and it was deliberate, and they talked about it, um, was to cross reproduction, to work women right up to the point if they got pregnant, to, to deliver, 
and with um, right, they worked them in the fields right up to the day before the liberation, and they put them back in the field um, a couple of days after. Uh, as long as they could, so the calculation was that if you can buy a young buck, as they say, for a day team and so on, and um, work them to death for eight years, not only will they get back the cost of buying them, but you make a handsome profit. And that was the fundamental. I say that was a, had genocidal consequences. And um, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to show you my data very quickly um, because it's possible now to demonstrate in quantitative terms what this meant. Um, the, um, this is, uh, the, the map gives you already an idea of, um, of what we're talking about. Um, you'll see, uh, this doesn't see um, you'll see just you know, where how few are going up to America, and how many are going to the, um, the Caribbean. And there's a, and what I have to show you this animation. Uh, this is a very, something very important that's happening in slave studies, the Atlantic Slave Trade um, Database, which has the ship manifest on almost every ship that crossed, or the over 30,000 ships that crossed the um, Atlantic. And uh, it's all now been put in a database. And so there are wonderful things we can do uh, with that data now. And I'm just going to show you. Uh, let, me, um, let me just indicate. Yeah, I'll get some help. Show you an animation. Um, and this is not a simulation, by the way. Every dot you see here is a shape. And we have data in every one of these dots. Oh. Look, look where they're going. Look how few are going up. Look where they're all going to the Caribbean, and most of them are going to Jamaica. <laughs> I mean, it's not incredible. Uh, so this, by the way, Jamaica is about a half the size of Connecticut. And we're talking about one line, we're talking about the entire mainland of America, and you can show it in uh, Mexico, and you can show it in Canada. Uh, okay? That, uh, okay. Each one of these. That I said is, um, ah, you see, that, that one little ship just going up to North America um, at about 17, the Gambia merchant, a uh, 100 pound ship, uh, okay, left, what I said, by 138, uh, arrived in 98, so about 40 died. Uh, on average, and um, but look, compare what is going on there with the vast amount going to these little islands. Okay, um, so that, um, yeah, so that's the pattern right up to the ending of the slave trade. All right, um, this graph gives you an idea of. Um, you know, I'm comparing America, I'm using America as a counterfactual, not America, to make my point. That is a massive genocide amounted to near approaching six million. Um, so there you see each one of these bars shows uh, the relative percentage of slaves that disembark in Jamaica and North America. Just just look at that. Who is North America? Uh, Jamaica alone, that's one little island getting far more, far more, okay? So until 1807 when it stopped. Um, so I won't go into that. Uh, let me just go then to the main point of all of this. Look at this table. Um, between 1650 and 1830, over a million Africans were taken to this little island of Jamaica, while only 388,233 were taken to North America during that entire period, okay? However, in 1830, there were two million, over two million enslaved Africans, and if you include freed blacks, a total of 2.3 million blacks in America. At the same time, only 319 
thousand of the or enslaved, and a total of 357 blacks, including the freed and mixed in Jamaica. So my argument, very simply, sort of using America as a counterfactual condition, if you like, had Africans and their descendants experienced the same rate of increase as the US. And by the way, the US is no angel. I mean, I can tell you how, I mean, you know, if you read the work of Streckel, the economic historians and so on, but I don't have the time to get into that. I mean, the mortality are relatively high. We're not dealing with sweet planters and so on. There's, I mean, you know, and if you go to some exceptional place like Louisiana, it's pretty brutal. But you know, just so you can take that as your counterfactual, but they increased at the same rate, which the Jamaicans could easily have afforded to do. Remember, they were 35 times wealthier than the US. And by the way, they were buying, it's not the, the argument that Jamaica is a tropical island and they didn't have enough food and America was growing its food uh, and so had more access to food. That's not answer. The point is, Jamaica, that rest of the Caribbean, was an integral part of the Atlantic system. They were buying their food from New England and New England was buying sugar from it. So they, they had the money to do it and they did not. They made a deliberate choice to kill them off. Work them eight years, they die, you replace them. So had Africans then experienced the same moderate rate of increase as the US, the 1830 black population in Jamaica should have been 5.262 million, and the total including the freed, six million. So take into account of the fact that only 359 147 survived in 1830, with the US as our counterfactual sort of um, uh, measure. We find then that there were 5.5 million missing black people in 1830. And that I'm saying is a measure of genocide, real genocide. One of the great genocides of the modern world. As you can see, it almost approaches the six million um, Jews in Nazca. Now, there are, let me conclude. Um, there are three important differences in this story. There's a temporal difference, of course. The Jewish social death lasted for 12 years, while that of Amer Jamaicans lasted for one. 83. I call this protracted genocide. The Jewish physical Destruction concentrated over a period of four years, while the Jamaicans lasted for 183. And the nature of the elimination, with Jews actually living bodies were destroyed, with Jamaicans apart from murders, shortened lives, and there were a lot. Um, the the um, potential lives were preventively eliminated. So I, um, I, I'm going to, and then I have a lot more to say, but I wanted to make a point that like this was a real genocide, okay, and, uh, in the sense in which I define it, as opposed to the ethnocide. Thank you. I'm afraid it is my horrible duty that we have to call this to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Let me just tell everybody uh, it'll be available on video soon so you can hear it again, uh, which I, I, I certainly feel like there are whole sections I need to hear again. Um, you're all invited to join us for a reception on the fifth floor, and we hope that you will. So thank you. Thank you again, Orlando. Thank you.